We should have a society that measures progress, not just by economic metrics like GDP, but by how many of us have a role we find meaningful. We should explore ideas like universal basic income to make sure that everyone has a cushion to try new ideas. If we were handed a perfectly ben benign, well-behaved AI, given our current political and, and economic atmosphere, we would, that would produce total chaos. We just have not, we don't have the, the, the ethical or political will to share the wealth. If there were just a few people that had it, they, they would be able to be, be essentially dic dictators of Earth, or, or, or you know, whoever acquired it, and, and, and if, if it was limited to a small number of people, they would, and it was ultra smart, they, were, they would have dominion over Earth. The amount of common euphoria and uncritical reception of an idea so big as universal basic income makes me question how many people realize nothing good exists without condition. Somehow we are supposed to trust huge corporations whose sole intention has always been consolidation of wealth and economic power to the point nothing and nobody can question their dominance. Corporations that track our every movement, follow our credit cards and cell phone IDs everywhere we go in order to have a perfect track record of our personality traits and thoughts. Corporations that, in order to bring greater profit for their shareholders, exploit child labor in undemocratic countries or failed states just so that they don't have to employ expensive labor in western societies. Corporations that aren't shy for being in bed with ones of the worst authoritarian regimes in order to expand their business. Corporations that actively pursue monopolies so that they have the power to influence social discourse and our behavior by manipulating what we can see, censoring what we can say, and filtering what we can know. Corporations that lobby and bribe our politicians by dumping hundreds of millions of dollars every year in order to rig our democratic process and maintain their unquestionable presence. Somehow we are supposed to expect that these corporations who have never cared about the values and the needs of the society, who have securely corrupted our democracy and know more about us than we know about ourselves, will give us all free income without any conditions. Politicians left and right, corporate leaders and people from all backgrounds seem to unite behind an idea that could have easily worked if we implemented it 100 years ago, when free market actually worked. I'm not here to question whether universal basic income would successfully elevate people out of poverty. I'm not here to question whether this form of guaranteed income would make people more productive. I agree that universal basic income could successfully achieve both of those things. I'm here to express my skepticism towards the new system and power relationships we are going to build when we implement universal basic income in combination with centralized automation. I'm not saying I'm 100% right. I'm just pointing out that we should be careful about what kind of world we are building under the premise of hopeful dreams and good intentions. There will be fewer and fewer jobs that a robot cannot do better. The debate about universal basic income is essentially a debate about whether this time technological revolution is going to be any different than the previous ones. And I am on the side that argues this time is going to be different. Artificial intelligence is going to destroy the need for human labor, but not for the reasons others argue. Elon Musk best summarizes this line of thinking. There will be fewer and fewer jobs that a robot cannot do better. Okay. What to do about mass unemployment? This is going to be a massive social challenge. I think that's right, but it's only a part of the whole truth. Robots are going to be better than us in everything, including manipulation, censorship and propaganda. Traditional propaganda function uh, that is employed by you know, BBC, Daily Mail, can be encapsulated by AI processes. You say, well, what harm could a deep intelligence in the network do? So, well, I could start a war um, by by doing fake news and spoofing email accounts and fake press releases and just by you know manipulating information. The pen is mightier than the sword. It's not just that the robots are going to be better, it's about what social contract we are going to implement around a system where robots can do everything better than humans. There may be a hypothetical time when robots will be completely indistinguishable from humans. 
but that time isn't going to be in our century and thus shouldn't be a core issue of our debate. We might never even reach that point. Artificial intelligence isn't dangerous because of what it can do, but because of how people who created it are going to use it. Instead, we should focus on how the development and deployment of automation currently takes place. And this is where, at least in my reasoning, the dream of universal basic income crumbles. My argument is that universal basic income is not going to create a better world. It might create a world where there is less poverty and starvation. But because people will no longer be needed in production, they will lose all of their power as workers to secure their rights and position in the social contract with their economic and political elites. Protesting and striking will lose all its value because corporations and politicians won't be reliant on human labor to prosper and grow their power. And that is going to happen if we don't change anything in the current trends of centralization of power and consolidation of wealth. Freedom consists of the distribution of power and despotism in its concentration. So when Musk implies that because robots will be able to replace humans... I think ultimately we will have to have some kind of universal basic income. I don't think we're going to have a choice. The emphasis should be on the word choice. I think Elon didn't pick this word by a stuttering accident. It might actually be one of his premonitions. Why exactly are we not going to have a choice? Isn't free market supposed to decide what people actually want in the so-called law of demand and supply? No business would want to create products in a system where they can't sell them because their customers can't generate income anymore. So is Elon Musk hinting that decisions of a handful of corporations will override the desires of the whole free market? And the intent with OpenAI is to democratize AI power. Um, there's a quote that I love from uh, Lord Acton. He was the guy that came up with power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely, um, which is that uh, freedom consists of the distribution of power and despotism in its concentration. And so I think it's important if we have this incredible power of AI that it not be concentrated in the hands of a few and potentially lead to a world that we don't want. I think this is what makes all the difference between technological revolution of today and those of the past. And that is precisely because human societies have never faced entities consolidating so much power as the biggest transnational corporations are doing today. The argument isn't that we shouldn't implement any form of a guaranteed income, but that we should do it on our own terms rather than have it shoved down our throats by big corporations with pseudo-liberal agendas and politicians who only care about re-election. Otherwise, Universal basic income is going to constitute a new social contract which we aren't going to have any say in. Saying the average American doesn't realize how much the laws are written by lobbyists. When we look at this issue from a historical perspective, each technological revolution completely changed the previous social order and created new forms of government. The next technological revolution triggered by artificial intelligence will also most likely result in a complete rearrangement of the social contract. And as I will soon demonstrate, this process has already started. Before the first industrial revolution in the 18th century, human relationships were tightly locked to the land they were working on. Ownership of more land meant higher position in the social hierarchy. The highest rank belonged to the king who owned most of the land in the kingdom. The lowest rank in the hierarchy was held by the peasants, the majority of the population. Most of the people who couldn't afford any land were working on fields for landlords. But even if those that could afford to own a land we usually didn't have enough means to protect themselves from raids. Just getting a sword, not to mention a horse, was usually extremely expensive. Which is why these people usually formed pacts with nobility and knights to protect them in exchange for tax from yields. When industrial revolution kicked off, it completely dismantled the previous feudal system. Mere possession of land was no longer a requirement for sustainable life. Only those who owned bigger and better machines and worked harder and smarter could accumulate more income. Workers previously tied to their landlords could now go freely into the cities and offer their labor at a plethora of working opportunities. As the Industrial Revolution went on, four things started to happen that are beginning to fade out from reality today. First, human labor entered free market and workers could choose from myriads of different jobs. Second, competition of business owners was very high and it was extremely easy for workers to switch jobs. 
Third, climbing social ladder was for the first time based on merit and hard work, and not on just an inherited social status. Fourth, the technological progress vastly improved living conditions and allowed for equal opportunities even for the bottom class. Presence of these four elements at the time of the Industrial Revolution brought about immense social changes. And likewise, their disappearance in our time is a symptom of an upcoming social restructuring. In the 19th century, these four new elements empowered the middle class and balanced the relationships between workers and business owners, even the most wealthy ones. It became easy for the middle class and workers to organize in unions. Economically, all workers are replaceable as individuals. But as an aggregate, they can unite to protest and strike to cause sudden systematic disruption. Through unions, workers and broad middle class were able to convert their economic power to political power. This is how working rights and universal suffrage were granted to people, not out of the benevolence of the political and economic elite, but because of the conversion of economic power to political influence industrial middle class could pull off to win their cause. The disturbance caused by workers not showing up at work but striking on the streets was too effective at damaging profits. Unions and workers' strikes are still present today, but they bear much less political power than they used to. Why so? Because today, workers, even as an economic aggregate, are replaceable either by outsourcing the production to countries with poor working conditions or by centralized automation. Previous generations fought for the vote and civil rights. They had the New Deal and great society. And now it's time for our generation to define a new social contract. Effects of the decreasing need for human labor are also multiplied by the new economy standard where companies no longer make most of their profits from sales, but when people use their products. Our approach is premium products at non-premium prices. So we sell the hardware at break-even. So we don't try to make any money when we sell this hardware. And we hope to make money when people use the devices, not when they buy the devices. But that still doesn't explain how we got to this state of extreme imbalance between current middle class and the wealthiest billionaires. Why is it that almost everybody benefited from the inventions of industrial revolution, but only biggest corporations benefit from centralized automation? And that's precisely because something used to be happening in the 19th century that is no longer the case today. And it's this. To balance the power of organized unions at the turn of the 19th century, businesses with significant market power also organized themselves in groups. By abusing the system of trust, businesses started buying stocks from one another, forming trade associations, or constituting conglomerates. This is how few big business owners managed to accumulate more percentage points of a certain market share when they couldn't do it purely by outperforming their competition with a better product. But unlike today, 19th century monopoly seeking attempts turned out to be largely unsuccessful because the public outrage of empowered middle class forced the government to take action. There are three most resonating historical cases. John Rockefeller's Standard Oil, J.B. Duke's American Tobacco, and James Hill's Northern Securities. All three of these companies sought to become monopolies in their industries following similar formula. Buying stocks of businesses that rely on them, merging and acquiring other companies to gain bigger market share, and cutting out other resisting competition by artificially underpricing your products to the point others are put out of business. Eventually, the US government sued all three of these companies under antitrust clause from the Sherman Act. The courts later ordered to dissolve all of them as unlawful and artificial monopolies. And while some big businesses continue to engage in anti-competitive practices today, the government and the public no longer take any sufficient countermeasures. Since American Tobacco and Standard Oil were broken up in 1911, the only antitrust case that resulted in dissolution was the AT&T breakup in 1982. Predatory business owners managed to win the fight for the balance of power against the middle class. When in 2005, the Southwestern Bell Corporation recreated AT&T by purchasing its parent company together with a dozen of other children of the breakup from the 80s, the US government did nothing. When Verizon did the same with the rest of the baby bills in the same year, the US government did nothing. And that's how the two largest telecommunications corporations were born that today enjoy either a monopoly or a duopoly everywhere they operate. Forming business trust became the instruction manual for big businesses in every industry to create monopolies. Big banks caught up on the trend too. 
Thus, the regulation of the 80s and 90s allowed for the mergers of commercial and investment banks, which was strictly forbidden under the Glass-Steagall Act, repealed by Clinton in 1999. Taking advantage of other regulatory loopholes opened up by Reagan and Bush, banks began to engage in risky investments with people's money. Investment banks could make outrageous bets with high likelihood of failure because the money they used from the commercial banks were federally insured and backed by government bailouts in case of a downfall. Nothing changed on this despite the 2008 financial meltdown. Banks took this old industry standard to a whole new level. If you seek to become an artificial monopoly today, you don't get punished but reward it. You imagine that we've done our job perfectly and we've created you know, the most safe, beneficial AI possible, but we've let the political system become totalitarian and evil, either a world, evil world government or even just a portion of the globe. But it wasn't the banks that started the new technological revolution. It was the internet-enabled tech industry. Previous industrial revolution had a strong effect on morality. Feudalism was no longer okay, so was not slavery. And soon even child labor was banned. So did the new tech startups brought any moral innovation? High five yeah, there you go, high five. And... No! They build up on the old practices of predatory banks and telecoms. Google started off with the don't be evil, but even they quickly realized that being predatory at all costs is the way to go. Merit of the product is no longer what brings the winning. If you want to win, you have to consolidate faster than everyone else. Google took this to their heart so much they acquire or merge with a new business every month. And on top of the questionable acquisitions, Google abuses its dominant search engine position to censor out any competing business that offers similar services to the ones of Google. Google is no longer just a search engine, but hundreds of other things, including an email provider, biggest video hosting site, developer of artificial intelligence, but most notably, Google is an advertiser, which means they are a data broker. The same goes for Facebook, which also is a data broker and an advertising network, more than it is a social media platform. Apple too acquired 30 companies just in 2014, and companies that Apple couldn't acquire found themselves fighting in aggressive pattern wars that Apple loves to wage in order to price out their competitors by excruciating legal costs. And remain certain that incumbent telecom operators like Comcast or Verizon do exactly the same, which is why you haven't probably seen so many successful municipal broadband projects or other competitive internet service providers. And just to be clear, none of these are legitimate monopolies. That is when a company outperforms competition purely based on the merit of their product. All of them are artificial monopolies which means they have actively conspired against competition through various legal gymnastics to artificially elevate their market position. Now all of this begs the most important question. Why is it that in the 1900s the government banned artificial monopolies, while today it is perfectly okay with them and even rewards them by bailouts from the taxpayers' money? The answer is this. Corporations today learned from the mistakes of the 19th century monopolies and began converting their economic power into political influence exactly what the middle class used to do at the time. And they did this by inventing the revolving door and dumping millions into lobbying. This is what it looked like in 2016. AT&T spent $16 million in lobbying just in that single year. 93 out of 120 AT&T lobbyists between 2015 and 2016 previously held government jobs. Google spent $15 million in lobbying in 2016 and had 78 out of 92 lobbyists from government. Verizon spent $10 million in 2016 with 84 out of 106 lobbyists from government revolving door. Facebook spent $9 million with 31 out of Apple, $4 million on lobbying, 38 previous government employees not working at Twitter, $700,000, 16 out of 17 lobbies came from Microsoft. $9 million on lobbying, 100 lobbies out of 118 with previous Amazon, $11 million, 56 out of 69 Walmart, $7 million, 
79 Comcast, $14 million. 126 lobbies out of Walt Disney, $4 million on lobbying. General Motors, $9 million on lobbying. Exxon Mobil, $12 million on lobbying. McKesson Corporation, 21st Century Fox, $5.5 million. Berkshire Hathaway, $7.3 million on lobbying. JP Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, $3.2 million on lobbying. Coca Cola, $8 million on lobbying. 35 out of 50 lobbies with previous government jobs. This is the conversion of economic power into political influence in the eyes of the big corporations. And what is the middle class doing to counter this? Nothing. Nothing at all. We are now incredibly divided because of the identity politics like massive cultural immigration and terrorism that weren't present in the daily lives of the 19th century middle class. When an important issue comes that we should unite behind, it never happens today because we completely rely on media intermediaries to deliver us information. When Amazon rolls out its Alexa devices into people's homes, the first thing that should be trending on YouTube is how it shamelessly spies on all household conversations and hands over all that private information to everyone willing to pay a nickel. Instead, Steven Crowder is only outraged that it's probably a social justice warrior. Alexa, did Muhammad ever hit Aisha? Sorry, I don't know that one. You damn well do. As if none of that collected information could be maliciously used at any point in the near future, with conservatives becoming the first targets. But I don't solely blame people for this. Corporations know they can do a lot with the potential of their algorithms. Tech monopolies realize that we trust them too much, so they started to abuse our trust and became extremely efficient at it. And don't just take my word for it, listen to Brad Weinstein for Christ's sakes. We are now in a very dangerous situation because, for example, uh, if Google and other of these online goliaths start uh, deploying algorithms that decide what we get to talk about and see, then we cannot use the very tools that are necessary in order to escape um, and avoid something like civil war. Facebook frequently conducts experiments on people who use it by manipulating their social feeds. In 2012, Facebook successfully manipulated people's emotions as part of a social experiment to measure how affected people are by the contents of their news feeds. It's just a prank, bro! Later, the New York Times reported on instances where Facebook actively manipulated trends on societal scale in third world countries that triggered massive social responses. The scale of one such response managed to overthrow the government of Indonesia. And in other six countries, Facebook decided to turn off visibility of news coverage to measure the impact on democratic development. Twitter most likely does the same by tweaking trending hashtags and blatantly censoring opinions that don't align with their agenda. Google has such a search engine monopoly that if they decide to put your name out of their rankings, you don't exist. They can easily rewrite the history or reality simply by tweaking its algorithms. Google is also extremely polite to the political elite when it doesn't even suggest anything controversial about their personalities. And everybody knows about YouTube's algorithms screwing up. In my case, YouTube allowed two of my 30 videos to get through the algorithm. The rest of my videos are just sitting here despite the fact that I do everything I can with search engine optimization for all of my videos. Amazon also enjoys immense power as a retail monopoly. If Amazon decides to not list your product, you are never going to make sustainable sales. This is how they completely transformed the book publishing industry, because if Amazon doesn't like some book, they'll take it off the shelves and publishers aren't going to support it. Big internet service providers, now vastly deregulated, can straight out filter all internet content, not only to just prioritize their services, but to also benefit certain agendas over the others. TV and radio are beyond repair, we all know that. But we at least expected the internet to be the medium of free flow of information. Not anymore. It is a very common practice for billionaires to buy news outlets and media companies. You could basically track ownership of 90% of US media to just a handful of the biggest corporations. Telecommunications providers step way outside of their original fields to also capture media dissemination and advertising industry, which I would say is a massive conflict of interest. One could almost think that CEOs of all of these companies could just sit behind one coffee table and decide what you are going to read about tomorrow. Every major social media tracks you across all of your online activities. They don't just use your likes, comments and private chats to profile you for advertising. You can't even get a device without an advertising ID attached to it. The moment you sign up for any service, you're logged for life. And here's the tragedy. 
we're building this infrastructure of surveillance authoritarianism merely to get people to click on ads. These are the conditions under which universal basic income is going to be negotiated. How this is not inclining anybody to believe it will result in some form of a dismantlement of democracy and free market is beyond me. So once again, you are very welcome to advocate for something so fundamentally impactful as universal basic income. But before you do, you should make sure you are sitting behind the negotiating table alongside those who are actually going to make that decision. Because right now, you are not even invited. And the intent with OpenAI is to democratize AI power. Our only chance to get a seat behind the table is to balance the distribution of AI power. And the only way we can do this is to develop decentralized and completely free and open source artificial intelligence. Not free as in free beer, but free as in freedom. That is an AI that everybody who uses it has full ownership rights and is granted full control over that ownership as opposed to a closed source product where your ownership rights are dictated by the developer of that product. This means you can transform, tweak or build up on the open source AI to improve it. By developing artificial intelligence under this open license, everybody can be granted equal access to the AI power. There is an open source alternative to Amazon Echo and Google Home called Mycroft, which explains the best how it works. Introducing Mycroft, the first open source artificial intelligence for your whole home. Mycroft is an open source, open hardware product based on the Raspberry Pi 2, which means anyone can contribute new features, develop modules, change or even redistribute Mycroft software. Missing a key feature? Just develop your own solution and contribute it back to the Mycroft community. And since Mycroft is based on Raspberry Pi, one of the most popular open hardware platforms in the world, there are already thousands of well-documented ways to extend and improve Mycroft's hardware. Upon delivery, Mycroft will have 20 great modules and more features will be coming online over time. And because it's open source, anyone with an idea can develop and share new modules with the Mycroft community. This is the only viable opposition to the proprietary AI developed secretively by big corporations. So what you can do right now is to start looking for open source alternatives and support their developers. This is why folks like Elon Musk are right about AI, while disconnected people like Mark Zuckerberg are completely wrong. The politics behind developing our open artificial intelligence is to make sure no actor can overpower everyone else by developing an exponentially more powerful AI. And this is what it's going to look like. However, I think if AI power is widely distributed, um, then, and there's not, uh, say, one entity that has some super AI that is a million times smarter than anything else. You know, if, if instead the AI power is broadly distributed, and to the degree that we can link uh, AI power to um, each individual's will, um, so like you, you know, you would have your AI agent, and you would like everyone would have their sort of AI agent, and then if somebody did try to do something really terrible, well, then uh, the collective will of others could overcome that bad actor. Um, which you can't do if, if there's one AI that's you know, a million times better than everything and else. And it's proprietary. And it's, yeah, it either has its own will or more likely, at least in the beginning, is controlled by you know, some small set of people. So um, I think that's, that's really the, the risk. I mean, um, you know, there's, there's always been these arguments, like what's the, what's the best form of government? Um, you know, I'm a big fan of... I think it was Churchill, like, you know, democracy is the, the worst form of government except for all the others. We can't rely on the promise of the world where we'll no longer have to work and corporations and governments will give us everything to make us happy. We should also own the AI and then with its power decide what kind of the world we shall build on top of it. We can't have a discussion about universal basic income without making sure the AI serves all of us and not just the lucky few biggest owners of automation. Not the government regulations, but open source developers are going to become our martyrs for freedom. Thanks for watching.